my name is Rachel Lucy Hitt. I am the Education Director at the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida. Um, and on behalf of our entire team, I'd like to welcome you here today for actually the first in our Strategies for Action series, um, today being White Myths, Black Lives, the Roots of Racial Oppression in America with Dr. Julian Chambliss. Um, just to start off with, you know, with everything that's going on um, in the world today, our, our center really wanted to take a look inward, um, and that meant starting with our mission. And for those of you that aren't familiar, our mission is to use the history and lessons of the Holocaust to build a just and caring community free of anti-Semitism and all forms of prejudice and bigotry. And we take that very seriously. Um, and so since at the heart of what we do, the core, the center is really education, we wanted to put together a series where we can all learn together, um, build our knowledge, our tools, our resources, um, to take action and, and create a better future together. Um, and so we're starting that off today. Um, before I introduce you to our speaker, I just wanted to let you know you saw this in the email you probably received, um, but our speaker will be using some polling throughout his presentation. Um, we'll be giving you the link to that as well, but please remember um, not to shut completely your Zoom. Um, we want to make sure that you stay with us. Either open up a separate browser or get a different device and you can use a phone or another computer. Um, and if you'd prefer to just sit back and observe, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, and lastly, if, if you have any questions throughout, um, you don't want to forget them to hold them to the end, please go ahead and just type them into the chat box. Or if you are um, joining in through Facebook Live, hello please feel free to put your comments and questions in there and we will make sure that we see them at the end of the program as well. So with that, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Julian Chambliss. Um, he is a professor of English with an appointment in history and the Val Berryman Curator of History at the MSU Museum at Michigan State University. In addition, he is a core participant in the MSU College of Art and Letters Consortium for critical diversity in digital age research. His research in interests focus on race, culture, and power in real and imagined urban spaces. His recent writing has appeared in American Historical Review, Phylon, Freeze Magazine, Rhetoric Review, and Boston Review. An interdisciplinary scholar, he has designed museum exhibitions, curated art shows, and created public history projects that trace community, ideology, and power in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julian Chambliss. Thank you. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And da, da, da. So hopefully you guys can now see me, see my screen. Um, thank you. I really appreciate the invitation uh, from the center to talk about history and representation related to race. Uh, before we start anything, I want to do a little test. So I want people to vote how many people are super excited about uh, being involved in online activities during this lecture. Uh, hmm, okay, well, seems like people are getting it. All right, that's good. The vast majority of you were with me. I appreciate that, thank you very much. Um, I want to think about uh, this process um, as a way to uh, use the sort of audience interactions a little bit to reflect on some points. Um, before I sort of go into this sort of historical overview of what I think of as sort of the roots of race and racial oppression, the systemic roots of racial oppression in the United States, I want to pause for a moment and try to think through this um, from a more visceral artistic perspective. And I'm gonna use the work of Kevin Gonzalez Day to do that. Uh, if you're not familiar with doc, Dr. Uh, with Mr. Gay, Mr. Day, uh, his work uses um, images like this. And I want you to take a moment and look at this image and consider what's there, but also consider what's not there. 
is there and also consider what's not there. And so here's another image. Again, consider what's there, what's not there. What's there, what's not there. Again, a little close up. So what you might recognize if you've seen any images of lynchings in the historic record are these are scenes of lynching. But what Kevin Gonzalez Day has done is he's removed the lynched body. He's removed the murder victim. And he's only left the crowd. He's only left the crowd. So my first effort here is take a moment and what does this erase lynching series is what this series of images is called say to you. Like you can type in a phrase, you can type in a word, whatever comes to mind and it'll, it'll appear here as a word cloud. So we're going back to that online interaction here. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Thank you. Yeah, it's powerful, right? More and more people are coming in. It's the system's a little laggy, but it's happening. The focus is on the crowd and how powerful that is. I really appreciate you doing that. So one question I would ask us to consider is, are the people in these images so different from us? What was it that created the context where Americans could go to what scholars and cultural, uh, cultural critics often refer to as spectacle lynchings in the late 19th and early 20th century and celebrate the murder of a person of color not just simply Black people, but Hispanic people, Chinese people, anyone uh, who is not white could be lynched in the United States. It depends on the region and its racial comp composition. How is that possible? It seems like those people are so much different from us, but what I want you to consider and what I want to talk about is how there is a system at play here that creates a context around race, citizenship, and practice that actually makes this possible. So um, when we think about this in the context of, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. When we think about this in the context of the American historical experience, especially even in the Western experience, there's a question here around race and power. Uh, the Western experience is really one that's defined by a very rapid and very powerful uh, expansion of Western powers into the, uh, or European powers into the West. And that created this context by which a number of people were exploited to create that system, right? This imperialism, the, the, the Russian empire that defines the Asian exploration is very important. So when you see images like I have here on the left, these images talk about the establishment of the American experience they talk about manifest destiny. They talk about even American imperialism in the latter part of the 19th century. And always within this context, there is a racial component, a very powerful emphasis on the sort of rightness of a kind of white European worldview and the ways that that might in fact be at the heart of our national character. And that's really one of the things that's driving this story. So I'm not quite sure where these marks are coming from on the screen. Do you see those, Rachel? You do see those. Okay. I do. Right, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where that's coming from. So I'm going to stop for a second and see what's going on there. Because it is Google Slides. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's not on my slides, actually. Someone's mentioning that it's uh, the whiteboard function. Someone annotated it. Um, my apologies, I've never used that before, so I'm not really sure how that um, is happening. But here and see if I can. Because I don't see it on my screen. Hmm. All right, well, I'm going to just continue on. And I'll try to figure out what, what it is. Uh, OK. Because I'm not actually seeing it on my screen. Um, yeah. OK, can you see this, my slides again? Okay, cool. All right. Sorry about that. So I wanted to talk about the sort of like colonial imperialism, the, the practice of colonialism uh, as a sort of like framework, right? So the thing I want you to take away from this idea is that at the very beginning of the establishment of the Western world, there is a practice that sort of centers Europeans and there's a practice that lessens people who are not. Right? So it centers white skin and less of people who are not. And the United States is a part of that practice. In some ways, we exemplify that thinking. For, for most people, the reality of this as a sort of like public discussion really has to do with the civil, map, civil war and its aftermath, right? And so at the heart of the civil war is actually a question around um, citizenship. But before I get to that, I have another one of those little polls. So, we can talk endlessly about this, but how long did the Civil War, how long did Reconstruction last? All right, okay. Blah, 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 blah. 14 years is winning out. Mm. Well, the actual right answer is 12 years, right? The right answer is 12 years. And that's because uh, we think about this, as this video points out, from a new series called Reconstruction. This series is about the period called Reconstruction between 1865 and 1877, when families divided by slavery were reunited. There was tremendous African-American institution building, churches, schools. The freed people valued education and pursued it like their lives depended upon it. The story of Reconstruction that's generally not known. So, when we talk about Reconstruction, so it's 1865 to 1877, so it's 12 years, right? So when we talk about Reconstruction, there is for many, many years uh, been a focus on a kind of white mythology around Reconstruction, right? It, it centers Abraham Lincoln. He freed the slaves. He didn't really, but he, in, the, in the narrative, he does. And so when you look at an image like this, a great cartoon from Harper's Weekly, uh, this is by Thomas Nash, really one of the sort of premier sort of visual artists of the 19th century, you can see a kind of white conception of emancipation. At the center, at the bottom is Abraham Lincoln, and then you have the experience of people of African descent in the United States sort of laid out. Well, this is an idea that really at the core of how people want to, to think about uh, slavery and its aftermath and Reconstruction uh, and, and the role of Abraham Lincoln. But really, Reconstruction comes down to a question of power at some very basic level. And the debate is, whether or not African Americans are no longer slaves, but by no means equal to white people, or African Americans are citizens of the United States with all the rights and privileges associated with that status. And it's true that you could find people in both parts of the United States in 1865 who believed these things, meaning that you could find someone in the North who did not believe that African Americans were equal to white people even though they were no longer slaves. And you can find someone in the South who believed that African-Americans were citizens of the United States and deserved all the rights and privileges associated with that. And Reconstruction is essentially about that reality. And it's interesting to see Reconstruction come back into the fore because the way we've been taught Reconstruction really starts to get at how these questions of like power and oppression play themselves out. These are also images from the 19th century and they sort of speak to how Southerners 
thought about Reconstruction. On the left is this sort of image of a white Republican talking to a Negro soldier and the radical Republicans who are really in control, quote unquote, radicals are in control of Congress after Andrew Johnson has his period of presidential Reconstruction, which is very mild. And under radical Reconstruction, African Americans are actually given the, given the rights and privileges associated with American citizenship. They vote, and in doing so, they can create a they create a new context of the Southern state. But because they vote and because they participated, and because their numbers are so great, they try to vision a different view of the South, right? In the sort of post post slavery world, as you can see from this sort of population map, if African Americans are allowed to participate in the South, it can be very, very important. For white people, white Southerners in particular, they could not accept this. And their vision and their narrative of Reconstruction is often one of criminalization and failure. The truth, of course, is very different in the sense that African Americans, along with white allies, very much wanted to reform the South. They, they instituted uh, better laws around uh, crime, uh, public education, they, they got rid of like debtors prisons, things that were incredibly regressive associated with the South were often changed during Reconstruction. But the racial question, that is, could black people be equal to white people? That is something that many Southerners can never let go. And so violence and power and race play themselves out whenever we think about Reconstruction as a period. When you look at this image, you can get the sense of how um, Southerners really sort of saw Reconstruction. We regarded Reconstruction Act as, as this unconstitutional revolutionary and void. And this was the, the position of the Democratic Party. And they often worked in opposition using violence through groups like the KKK and other groups like the White Citizens League to suppress African-American participation in the public discourse. So what you see in this image another famous image from Harper's Weekly, the Union as it was, and African-Americans cowed through violence. But it's not just simply African-Americans that are cowed through violence, also white allies. And the justification for this becomes very much uh, a narrative of, of Northern scallywags and um, Northern carpetbaggers and Southern scallywags, right? Southerners being, scallywags being Southerners that, that work with Republicans. All the violence that we associate with the rise of the KKK in this period are very much deliberate attempts to suppress African-American votes. When Reconstruction comes to, a, to an end in 1877, uh, what historians sometimes refer to as the Redeemer Southern Democrats, right? These Redeemer Southern Democrats took over the South. They won the election by suppressing the Black vote, as this cartoon points out. Uh, the caption reads, Every point, everything points to a Democratic victory this fall. And this is because the federal government, that is a Republican government, compromised in 1877 because of a very close presidential election and promised to end Reconstruction, promised to end federal oversight. And as a result, Reconstruction came to an end. And Southern Democrats went about the business of suppressing people. So here's another little quiz for you. I'll see if that one works. That one doesn't seem to be working. Oh, now it should be working, sorry. <laughs> okay, homeless, criminal, gotcha. Any other comments? All right. Um, that's a lag thing. So I'm going to get back to this question of vagrants, but before I do that, I want you uh, to see this quote from W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois is, of course, the sort of foremost sort of black intellectual of the 20th century, and he talks about police and systems of control in his famous quote from uh, The Souls of Black Folks. He says, the police system of the South was originally designed to keep track of all Negroes, not simply of criminals. When Negroes were free, the whole South was convinced of the impossibility of free Negro labor, and the first and almost universal advice was to use the courts as a means to re-enslave the blacks. And he wrote about this in 1903, 
in the souls of black folks. So the question here becomes, um, what do we mean? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second. Again, with the, the odd, which isn't on my slide. I'm not sure about that. I'm sorry. Okay. Perfectly all right, Dwayne, please. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's going to take a moment for this to boot back up. All right. Okay. So vagrancy is actually one of the consequences of reconstruction, not just simply as a legal term, but as a tool of criminalization and control of public space. I think this is really important to understand, as W.B. Du Bois is pointing to as early as 1903, that the nature of policing and its impact on people of color has always been this defined at some level by this, in, this incident, incident of control. So as soon as the war was over in Virginia, they passed the, the Vagrancy Act of 1866, which was typical of these things called the Black Codes, which was one of the reasons these codes were the things that were passed by Southerners in presidential reconstruction, that period before congressional reconstruction, what we call radical reconstruction. By Southern whites, they passed these Black Codes, these codes that define what Black people could do. And these codes were in part the reason why you got radical reconstruction. So because when Republicans saw what they did and they saw how basically they were trying to reinscribe slavery through some other kind of legal means, they forced them to, to pursue what we understand to be sort of like reconstruction. And vagrancy was always a part of this, right? So it wasn't a new idea when it comes into the fore uh, when reconstruction comes to an end. What it does is it allows for Southerners in control to criminalize black people in public space. Because anyone who is black could be a vagrant in the way vagrancy laws were written. This allowed for the criminalization of black people in public space that in fact has very powerful consequences. Because the rise of sort of vagrancy laws and the criminalization that comes from it has been well documented in how it constrained and controlled black people throughout the South. This book by Douglas Blackman is, is a prime example. So let me by another name talks about this process of suppressing black freedom after the end of reconstruction. And that labor is very important to Southerners, like that slave labor, right? That new, newly, newly created slave re-enslavement labor is very important because the fastest growing cities in the United States in between 1880 and 1910 were all Southern cities. And much of that improvement, that transformation associated with the South, much of it was done by uh, convict labor, right? The, the, the Better Roads campaigns that transformed Southern, Southern roads, much of that was convict labor. Many of the industries in places like Florida, the turpentine industry, the naval industry, convict labor, even the iron industry in, in Birmingham, convict labor. That labor was very important and was very, very much a part and re reimagining of a slave system. The other side of this is that that same sort of emphasis on controlling black bodies meant that even if black people weren't necessarily like vagrants, if they were just free economic actors, they could be killed. As um, Paul Ortiz documented in his work about Florida in the 1880s and in, in, in 1890s, Black workers who competed in the marketplace with white workers, if they you know, were willing to take less money, they could be killed, as he documents in this case in Sanford. So why does this matter, this idea of like this sort of like control? Well, the reason is this, and this is uh, um, from Condemnation of Blackness, which is Khalil Gibran Muhammad's book about scientific racism. So I want to show you a little clip from that. The book it really unpacks the origins of the way that we think and talk and in some instances respond to um, African-American criminality. Um, it looks at the earliest moment where uh, statistics became a kind of uh, universal language to talk about a crime among African-Americans 
uh, in what people then figured was an objective way, a way that was race neutral, that it was um, not embedded in the earlier debates um, that were either pro-slavery or anti-slavery. So this new statistical language emerged out of the 1890 census. It was the first census to record African Americans who had born and who had been born uh, free of slavery's grip. Um, 25 years old uh, for someone born in 1865 when that 1890 census uh, was recorded, and it discovered that 30 percent of the nation's prisoners were black, and black people only made up 12 percent of the population. And so, in that one instance, that that overrepresentation of African Americans in prison really led to an explosion of new interest in this data point. Um, and it, it, in a sense, brought together people who had once been formally uh, ideologically opposed to the notion that black people were sort of naturally inferior, naturally inclined to, um, uh, to offending, um, uh, had uh, natural proclivities to stealing um, and breaking the law. And so now all of a sudden liberals and conservatives uh, blacks and whites, northerners and southerners, see this data point and say, well, my gosh, maybe African Americans um, are inclined to criminality. And So <laughs> this idea that um, scientific racism is re really sort of built on a kind of falsification of black people's bodies and the criminalization through practice is important because like, it creates a different kind of context. And so uh, context is for kings is, as I, I mentioned here, uh, a quote from Star Trek. So I'm going to show you that quote from Star Trek um, for a reason. Don't worry. But not for the reasons you think. Your assumption that the Klingons were waiting in ambush at the binary stars was predictive. You chose to do the right thing over and above what was sanctioned. Even a great cost to yourself. And that is the kind of thinking that wins wars. Kind of thinking I need next to me. Universal laws for lackeys. Context is for kings. It's important to recognize that this is the bad guy in that show, and I like that 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 little little turn in part because this gives us another way to think about this period of, of the latter part of the 20th century and the, the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, because it puts in the context how Black people have to act in the sort of criminalized public space that's being created through policy and practice of white people. And no one sort of typifies this better in my mind than Booker T. Washington, because he's always lauded as this figure who compromised uh, around the question of racial justice, right? Because he gave the famous Atlanta Compromise speech here in 1895. And Washington is doing this in the context of this really criminalized public space. It's important to recognize that the Tuskegee University that he founded was also a refuge for Black people. And he often tirelessly worked in the background through Republican political channels to try to get services and benefits to Black people. It's also important to recognize that a lot of his public statements and public practice around going from state to state he did a tour of Florida, for instance, used systems of support and benefit that he helped create around African-American communities and spaces to try to counteract the narrative of African, African-American failure. But it's true in this very famous speech, as I, I sort of outlined here, he sort of spoke to the sort of imagining of white people, both in the North and in the South, who were concerned primarily with economic betterment, right? They wanted, they wanted to have economic power, but also they didn't want to necessarily deal with the consequences of trying to protect African Americans' political rights. And so he accepted this idea of social separation. But if you look at his paper, what he's saying is like, I'm going to accept this because we don't have the capacity to fight against this all-encompassing system. We need to build the capacity to do more. And in fact, a lot of his work really thought about what it meant for African Americans who had been historically tied to the land and denied access to resources, what it would mean for them to improve themselves. And if you look at his work, he really sort of identified education, skill building, creating communities as like pivotal things that African-Americans need to do, which is why Eatonville 
exists at some level. This is one of those, this is an ideology of Booker T. Washington put into effect. Indeed, the school there, the Hunger for School, was founded by graduates of the Tuskegee University. And Eatonville is a place where African Americans sought refuge, right? They, they created their own community and the, and the language that they used there in terms of promoting the community to outside residents was very much about this idea of this being one solution to this incredibly rising hostility being created by white racism in the world. So that hostility is all encompassing. And it's important to recognize that you don't have to scratch too far under the surface to see how the systemic process sort of laid itself bare. So in this uh, oral history from a man from Jacksonville, he talked about why he left the South. And in fact, this is a period uh, not just simply during the Great Migration, but even before where African Americans are trying to get out of the South because of this incredible hostile environment. In this particular case, William Stephens talked about uh, his teacher giving him these sort of uh, lessons from the Bible, another classic practice that stretches back to the antebellum period where slave owners would use the Bible to try to justify slavery. That same practice was continuing into the early 20th century and he just couldn't take it. And so he ran away. He moved to the, he moved to the North. So the practice here is very important because the narratives of, of how Southerners chose to remember the past, how they formulated their worldview really starts to dominate and erase the realities of the causes of the Civil War and the practices of murder, criminalization, and death that white people use to maintain control. And nothing is more clear in this process than the lost cause mythology that really starts to take hold in the first decade of the 20th century. The Daughters of the, the United Daughters of the Confederacy is a group we most closely associate with building these memorials to Confederate soldiers across the South. Yes, they built those memorials at a moment where many of the people who actually fought in the war were dead, so they couldn't contradict them. And they, bought, they, they, they also enshrined within these memorials in the spaces that are connected to them, a narrative associated with something called Edward Pollard's The Lost Cause, which we actually coined, he coined that term immediately after the war. He wrote that this treatise in 1865 talking about the war, not as a war uh, to preserve slavery, but it's this sort of like glorious lost cause. And this really becomes like a kind of um, religion, right? Like it's, it's an orthodox religion in the South. And part of that religion is a misremembering of the past. And Florida is no different here, right? So the tenets of the lost cause become an important part of like how we publicly want to remember Southern experience, right? Secession was the cause of the war, not slavery. African-Americans were slave, faithful slaves. Um, Confederate soldiers were heroic and saintly. Uh, the most heroic Confederate soldiers, Robert E. Lee. And of course, Lee's statue is all over. He has bobbleheads, which tells you something about his popularity. And Southern women were loyal and sanctified uh, by the conflict. This sort of mythology about the South and about the Civil War helped to justify and reinforce Jim Crow segregation, but also helped to justify and reinforce the need for the violence that's associated with Jim Crow segregation. So it's important for you to see this because as I say, this is a popular narrative that becomes part of practice. So I'm giving you a warning here. This is a uh, postcard. And it's not out of character for a lot of the lynching postcards that were produced in the early 20th century. So when I say, uh, when, I, when I show you Kevin Gonzalez Day's pictures where he's removed the black bodies and forced you to sort of look at the crowd, I want you to understand that this is a postcard that people sent to people like we would send postcards today and it featured murder and death and torture of African-Americans. And indeed, there are numerous accounts of like the festive, festive like atmosphere that would be uh, found during a lynching. They would cut off body parts, keep them as souvenirs. They would take these pictures and use them in close cards. And this gives you a sense of the justification around suppression of African-Americans. Like violence was a tool as part of that process, but it was also part of a broader narrative about white supremacy that justified those actions. 
there's a continuum that we have to keep in mind when we think about this, right? There's a very dangerous landscape here. Uh, lynchings and the epidemic of lynchings in the 1890s really continue well into the 1930s. The last sort of what we call spectacle lynching is in the 1930s. But if lynching itself, the threat of lynching itself wasn't enough, to maintain sort of superiority and control, we also know that white people employed violent erasure of black faces when it was necessary. So riot, the race riots that really permeate the latter part of the 19th century, going to the 20th century, the destruction of black communities that were often economically successful, that was the real reason that these communities were destroyed, a Koei being an example, or um, uh, the, the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, or the Springfield riot. These riots were often part of a political and economic context, right? The riots that were leading up to uh, the latter part of the 19, 19 teens, in part, the reason these riots were happening because of tensions around the emergence of women voters, right? There was concern that Black women would get the right to vote, and this would shift, uh, shift the political landscape a little bit. And this sort of spurred um, concerns and, and a heightened sort of political connotations around, around uh, the political landscape. And that spurred some of these riots as well as well as the sort of economic competition in the North because of World War I. So there's always, despite the sort of like social narratives around white women, when we look very closely in the record, there's much more sort of political and economic driving this anti-Black violence. So this is a picture of Tulsa after the riot. So, what can African Americans do? Well, almost from the beginning, again, people like Booker T. Washington are reacting to the, the reality of living in this very hostile environment. And people like W.B. Du Bois are increasingly dedicated to trying to fight against uh, this sort of like white violence. And in fact, the, the tension between Du Bois and, and, and Washington is, is an interesting one in the history books because both of them are reacting to this rising tide of anti-Black anti-Black violence. It's just that they're trying to do it different ways. For Du Bois, the only real solution is a political solution. So first with the Niagara Movement in 1905, where he's reacting to the violence that happened in Atlanta. He lived through the Atlanta race riot. And then with the NAACP in 1909, he uh, is championing a legal response to this sort of systemic anti-Black violence. And really, at the core of the NAACP's activism is holding the government accountable to making sure that Black people's constitutional rights are not ignored, which he sees as systematic. And in which is in fact true, Black people can be murdered and people are never brought to justice. In fact, we still don't know how many Black people were murdered during this period. The numbers are, are, are only sort of uh, kept by Black people. And some, even some of that uh, isn't, isn't fully documented, right? Like, we just don't know. We, we continue to find more and more of these cases. So this is a, my final uh, a little, little uh, interactive piece here as we get close to the end. And it's asking a, a somewhat silly question, but an important one. Has that firm actually been going, well, okay. Well, you guys are really good. <laughs> um, so you're right. Um, and I want to bring that to the fore because like, as we get later to the 20th century, this question of race, space, and identity becomes very much one of what the government is willing to do, right? It was always a question in the 19th century, but it becomes even more important as we get into the modern era as civil rights movement gains steam, this very long civil rights movement, right? We can trace it back to really the era of reconstruction, but there's a modern civil rights movement that dominates a lot of our, our imaginations, right? And so, African-Americans, especially in that period between World War I and World War II, are very vibrant in their activism. They fight in both those wars at some level to prove their citizenship. And a lot of the American propaganda at that time is trying to overcome what people know is the racism of the country. And nothing sort of like catches this than uh, some of the propaganda films of the period. And I love these propaganda films because Frank Capra made, made a few of them. And so I'm going to show you one that he made called The Negro Children, just a little bit of it. <laughs> 
My prepared text today was to have been, Make thy name be remembered in all generations. But I think I'm going to depart from my prepared sermon. While I was listening to the sergeant solo, I kept looking up at our service flag. I was thinking of the men in service. I see some of them here this morning. Private Roberts. Sergeant Jackson. Lieutenant Carter. And, uh, um... Private Parks, first class. First class so, is right. One of the things about these propaganda films is they are answering at some very real level the propaganda coming from the enemy that talks about the racism in the United States. This is true in World War II. And it's also true in Vietnam War that like, and during the Cold War, especially the ideological conflict between uh, the United States and the USSR, people often point to the fact that the United States promotes freedom, but black people are enslaved. So this propaganda question is an important one, right? Because it's part of this sort of reality of the post-war period. Because in that period, when Americans come back, white soldiers have the opportunity to take advantage of something called the GI Bill. And it's important to recognize that the GI Bill is a direct result of World War I because World War I veterans were promised a bonus, right? And they never got that bonus. And during the Great Depression, a number of these veterans banded together and started marching towards Washington. And this bonus army was met by military force and dispersed uh, when they arrived. And because people remembered that, after World War II, the Congress was like, we can't allow that sort of thing to happen. And so they craft, in part, the GI Bill as a way to ensure that the veterans that fought in this war get the benefits of that. And of course, it is transformative to the United States. All the people who, who fought in the war had access to these funds, but not all the people could use them. And for African Americans, this is very important because, of course, the GI Bill helped spur on suburbanization, home ownership, going to college, all these things the GI Bill paid for. But African Americans were not able to take advantage. We want white tenants in our community is an example of how African American veterans ran into the problem of white segregation not allowing for them to get um, loans in most communities. And we know this very well. We've documented this in very m multiple ways. This is a great digital project called Mapping Inequality, where they take the sort of like uh, HOC, HOLC, the Housing and Urban Development uh, sort of assessment data, and they show how they systematically uh, devalue black spaces in black black neighborhoods and made it impossible for you to get loans in those in those places. And these maps really sort of show how black spaces in black communities were denied the sort of affirmative action offered up by the federal government after World War II. And of course, owning a home is the number one driver of wealth for most American families. So black people being shut out of that marketplace is incredibly important. And it's all related to race. But another consequence of that sort of like spatial segregation that go along with this sort of social segregation is criminalization, right? Remember, black bodies have always been criminalized and controlling black spaces and the danger posed by black spaces is enshrined in the real estate industry. And so how do you control that? Well, you police those spaces, right? And there's a whole host of uh, histories and practice that we associate, especially in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, with this sort of like rhetoric of ghettoization and the danger posed by black spaces and the aggressive policing that we associate with those spaces. And the consequences of that um, play themselves out in, in conservative politics, uh, I'm not picking on Richard Nixon, but in part, Richard Nixon was able to finally make his way to the to the White House by claiming America had lost its way and fighting against the sort of social reform that we might associate with something like the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson. And his 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 question of the Great Silent Majority really leveled and and and, and really took advantage of this sense that the urban America, America of Black and Brown and Yellow people was uh, slipping into chaos. And what you needed was a police, police action to suppress this. Um, those ideas persist into 
uh, the contemporary period in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan, conservatives really sort of like doubled down on this belief in the sort of systemic failure of the black community, uh, losing ground, which is one of the really strong um, sort of conservative uh, pieces written by Charles Murray, talks about how social support programs that we not associate with the Great Society or even the New Deal for that matter, this incentivized success for black communities. So what you needed to do was take those programs away, ignoring this sort of systemic way that race and racism and violence sort of impacts uh, the black and brown communities of the United States, urban communities in particular. And at the same time with, with white flight, with, with greater suburbanization, the federal government gave more money to suburban communities that would not on their own be able to be successful. So you white people could leave urban areas, leave those, those communities, acquire homes and suburbs, and then those suburbs could incorporate and become municipalities that could get access to federal money so they could, could remain independent. And that sort of um, deprived these inner cities of their ability to sort of do and provide services to help people. And so the consequences become a sort of magnifying effect over time. I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about this in the contemporary landscape, we can always find the statistics to show how this criminalization of space and its impact on people of color is quite clear, right? Driving while black, uh, studies that show police people uh, pulling over African Americans, unfair uses of um, misdemeanor law. Like if you think about Ferguson, Missouri, one of the reasons people ride in Ferguson, Missouri is they have had years of these sort of unjust uh, misdemeanor laws like, you know, uh, jaywalking tickets, uh, vehicle infractions, which we know from studies are a way for municipalities to generate revenue. And even as, as this case in Tampa, Florida indicates, African Americans riding bikes uh, would get tickets from the police at a much, much higher level than white people riding bikes, even if they were, you know, supposedly breaking the same sort of vehicular laws governing bikes. And so these practices have a long justification in, in sort of like social narrative around black people in black spaces. And the consequences, of course, are impossible to ignore. Uh, this is a, a report for the Pew Research Center that sort of highlights this. Uh, they do this report periodically. I think this was about from 2015, 2016, where it shows that black people express lower confidence in the police uh, than white people. But you could do this report any day of the week and you would have gotten the same result. It's important to recognize that the reality of black lived experience in terms of policy and practice primes them to understand how those practices are uneven. And there's numerous studies that, we, that talk about this in employment, in housing, in the application of law. So I say all that to say that there is a, a practice and a cultural sort of like learning that sort of created the context of oppression. If you want to know more, like my ramblings didn't make sense to you, uh, these two links will take you to stuff that will in fact allow you to learn more, the first will take you to a list of digital humanities projects, that is projects that are on the web that are talking about the black experience in various forms. And the second is to a number of documentaries that you can get through your library. There are a couple of YouTube videos that I put in there that will allow you to sort of like learn more about black, uh, black experience and, and racism and some of the devastating consequences of this practice in terms of the American experience. So I think I did pretty good when it comes to time. I feel proud of myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chambliss. Yeah, I, there. this is way too little time. I recognize <laughs> that. So I apologize for that. And then of course, with any technical difficulties, it takes away. Um, but thank you for leaving a few minutes for, um, for some questions. So if anyone is interested in um, submitting a question, please feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, a couple came in earlier as you were speaking. So um, I thought I could read a couple of those to you if you're ready. Sure. Um, Art Miller had sent in, how would you compare racism to anti-Semitism? It always appeared to me there were common enemies. Was there an effort between blacks and Jews to create a common goal to free all people? 
Sure, it's important to recognize that in the history of the United States, African Americans and Jewish Americans often been very close in terms of freedom and civil civil liberties activism. So this is probably most strongly articulated uh, in the context of the civil rights movement, uh, but it's also super, I think, sort of represented in some of the more radical elements. A lot, a lot of a lot of black radicals had Jewish lawyers, and I know that's a little bit of a stereotype. But they articulated uh, through both black and Jewish intellectuals, right? So black people get a lot from uh, sort of Jewish Jewish activism. And while I think the popular press sometimes uh, puts a lot of emphasis on tensions uh, between a sort of urban and context of like urban uh, uh, conflict between civil rights leaders, in the broad spectrum, there's a lot of similarities in African Americans and Jewish Americans, especially uh, in, in the early part of the civil rights movement, were very much very closely aligned. And that remains very much the case because when we think about the rise of anti-Black violence, it often corresponds with a rise of anti-Jewish violence too, right? Like it's not, there's no, there's no uh, surprise that when we see spikes in anti-Black violence, you also see spikes in anti-Jewish violence because those are two groups that even in the Southern context were scorned, right? Like remember, uh, Southerners tended to be very, very negative towards Jews as well. Um, and so you just look at the Southern Poverty uh, Council's list of uh, racial things and you can see how those things correspond. And actually there was a related question to that as well um, from Sherry Croft. It seems that the relationship between black and Jewish people has been broken. How can we repair that relationship? You know, I think that one of the things about uh, this idea of it's been broken is that the, the focal point around um, black activism especially in, in, the, in the last few years, has been more systematic in uh, questions around police brutality. Uh, and, and I think that focus, it has a, a little bit more immediacy for African-Americans and the, and the activism and the activists out in front um, are, are really speaking to a very particular set of experiences. And that shrouds, I think, a broader narrative. Because I do think that there is, it continues to be a dialogue between African Americans and Jewish people around, uh, for instance, truth and reconciliation activity around race and, and space in the United States. So if you start looking at, at those spaces, you do see coalition building, but it's true that because of the nature of some of the public narratives that are uh, capturing the, the, the center of the public square, as it were, it seems that, that that white people are not there, uh, and Jewish people, Jewish people are not there. But I, it's often I think important to recognize that all these all these sort of conflicts have multiple layers. And if you look to the to the periphery and look to these organizations that are, are you know, especially talking about question around, um, I, I think of the truth and reconciliation space in particular is very multicultural, very multi generational, for instance, uh, because they take on elements of like sort of Christian. Uh, theology, but also like, you know, a lot of religious sort of things uh, that you do see, continues to see cooperation. I do think that it's important to, to recognize a new generation of people is coming to the fore. And because of that new generation of people, um, they are redefining the, the full extent of freedom, which is always the case. And younger generation looks to a much more robust definition of freedom building on the gains of the previous generation. So I do think there's like there's 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 a question about the conservatism of older people in the black community versus um, what they see as the more radical uh, nature of narratives coming from younger people. Uh, but I, I would never say that that cooperation doesn't exist. It just exists in, in spaces sometimes not getting as much attention as as the protests on the street for obvious reasons. Thank you. And if I 
may also just add on to that just slightly that the, the these groups right these boxes of Jews and and black Americans are not necessarily mutually exclusive um, and there's a lot of Jews of color that are trying to actually be bridge builders in, in this work um, but their voices are often suppressed um, and are receiving this kind of discrimination on many different fronts and is wonderful if we can also look within those groups as well um, we're running out of time, so I'll try to be quick. Um, there was a question on um, who decided Black GIs were not included in the GI Bill. So it's not that Black GIs were not included. It's that they could not act on the GI Bill in the same way, right? So one way to, to think of it as you are a Black GI, you, they say you have access to the GI Bill, but if you try to go and, and buy a house in a white neighborhood, they say no. William Levitt, Levitt Town, the most famous of all the post-war developers, would not sell to Black people. Now, if you did get a loan, which you could, and you did buy a house in a white neighborhood, which they did, sometimes people would come and burn down that house and attack you, which they also did. So like one of the most famous cases um, of this is in Chicago, where a Black veteran, an army officer, bought a house and he literally had to defend his house with a gun as angry neighbors uh, attacked it. But African-Americans did spend, did use the money uh, in black neighborhoods. For instance, in Winter Park, there were a number of housing developments that were developed um, and advertised to black veterans in the 1950s. I've talked about those before. Magnolia Gardens and Carver Town are two subdivisions that were developed and advertised to black veterans because they knew black veterans had access to um, the GI Bill. And black veterans did use the education component to go to HBCUs, uh, but you know, ran into uh, stronger resistance to trying to go to white institutions. But again, it's, it's a question of, yeah, there's the, the, the way the law is written, but then like these practices and actions of, of the public to subvert um, sort of the constitutional rights of, of people of color. And Dr. Chambliss, we, we have tons um, of comments that are coming in and questions. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. I will make sure that you get to see all the comments as well because there, um, there's some wonderful ones coming in. Um, but I wanted to, to thank you for being here, even on a personal note, like it was such a treat to hear you speak again. For those of you that don't know, actually uh, Dr. Chambliss, although not living in Central Florida anymore, um, lived here for many, many years and was actually one of the, um, one of the scholars in my very, very uh, early days of doing diversity and inclusion work that um, impacted me and we had the um, pleasure of working together. So I appreciate you for coming back. <laughs> You're always welcome here. Um, and also know that, you know, this is titled Strategies for Action, right? And so we are going to be having an entire series of different ways we need to be able to take this knowledge that Dr. Chambliss has gifted us with. Um, because I always say, right, we have to do our own work, but we are just very lucky when people are able to help us along that journey, although it's not anyone's responsibility but our own. Um, and that we need to figure out ways that in our own circles of influence that we can do something for positive change. And so the next session that we have, um, I will be co-facilitating with Angela warren -Size, um, from UCF um, on allyship, being an accomplice, what those actually mean, um, and that there's multiple pathways um, that need to be taken, a multi-pronged approach to um, racial justice. So again, thank you, Dr. Chambliss, for being here. Um, everyone that, that's still here, please, before you leave, um, we're going to put a link in the chat box. Um, if you could please just click on it really quickly. It'll take just two minutes of your time to get some feedback um, from you all. It's very, very important to us. And if you know anyone that was um, wanting to come but not able to, we have recorded today's session. Um, and we will be posting it on our website. So please go ahead and, and share that um, with all your friends and colleagues. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to um, take a moment to turn it over to one of my colleagues, Kathy Turner. Is she on right now? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Softly. 
<laughs> okay. Yes, up. Okay. Well, super quick, but very special and sincere thank you to, to all of you who have contributed in some way to the special programming. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do these programs like the one today without generous community support. So um, thank you to all those contributors. Uh, the series is really exciting for us to be able to offer and also very, very important. Uh, so we truly appreciate and we welcome all support to keep the conversations going. Uh, so also look for a link to donate in the chat uh, as well as in that follow-up email. And again, thanks to all of you for participating and showing your support of this. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon and weekend.